Well, hi everyone, my name is Mark Kruth and I am Atlassian's Modern Work Evangelist. Uh, what that means is I get to spend my days working with both customers inside and outside of Atlassian, helping them kind of try to traverse this modern, new, crazy world we live in, right? So, and coming out of that, it's kind of neat, I get to talk about it in places like this. So for today, I want to actually introduce you to my, lab, uh, my laboratory. But uh, you know, it doesn't feel right. I don't, I don't think we got the right vibe going on. So let's, let's actually change this up a little bit. So uh, let's see here, gonna, gonna get my coat. All right, got the coat going on. Let's see, a little bit of mad scientist goggles. All right, that's feeling a little bit better. All right, all right. So where were we? Welcome to my laboratory. See? All right, I'd like to welcome you guys to this talk. I wanna to talk to you about a new form of science out there that I'm super passionate about. It's very forward thinking, could even be considered a little scary. But before I get into it, I need to show you something a little bit more scary. That's gonna be our legal disclaimer. I'm not gonna promise you anything around our products today. That's what it's telling you. But what it is gonna, what I will promise you right now is that I'm gonna show you a whole new way to think about science today. All right, let's do this. So to gain an appreciation of science, I think we need to practice it a little bit, right? So let's actually try this out. So we're gonna do a little experiment here right now. So first thing I need to do is everyone pull out your cell phones. All right, get your cell phones out. And what we're gonna do is I want you to go ahead and either scan this QR code or put in that URL. So go ahead, grab a picture, type it in. And once you've done that, we're gonna go and learn a little bit about each other and see what makes each other tick a little bit. All right, I'm gonna jump us into the first question. First question, would you rather play at the beach in the sand or in the water? Where would you be at? Sand, water, maybe neither? Where do you think you land? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Oh, oh it looks like we've got some, we got some scores coming in here. We got water, we got sand. Give you just five more seconds, get your votes in. All right, so looks like water is it. You know, I mean, you're going to the beach, I guess you better get in the water, you know? Especially now, it's like 80 degrees outside, it's beautiful. All right, next question. This is a serious question too. Is a hot dog a sandwich? This is a very controversial one. I wanna know, where you at? Where you at on this one? Ooh, we got some no's, some yes, depends. Oh, okay, all right. Few more seconds, few more seconds. Oh, all right, apparently we got about 69% of y'all out there that are wrong, but I'm just saying. I'm, from, I'm near to the Chicago area, so when I have a Chicago dog, that, that is definitely not a hot dog. It's, it's way more than that. All right, last question, and this is gonna be the most critical one we learn about each other today. How long would you survive a zombie apocalypse? Maybe a day, a week, a month, or forever, because you're just the biggest fan of The Walking Dead. Where are we at? Oh, 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 we got a couple. They're coming in, they're coming in. Oh, all right, I'm starting to make friends with about a quarter of you right here. So those 27% that says forever, let's meet afterwards. I need to become friends with you. So when this happens, we're all safe. All right, so I do this because this is a way of getting to know each other. It's a way to experiment getting to know each other. It's a, it's a kind of thing that we do in science. So for today, I wanna to talk to you about the science of alchemy. And many of us know about alchemy. We know about this idea that it's all about turning lead into gold. It's about turning something worthless into something priceless. But the new science I wanna talk with you about today is actually a new form of alchemy. It's a higher form of alchemy. Call it interpersonal alchemy. This is that idea of turning an okay group of people into a supercharged team. Let me tell you a little bit of, let me tell you a story about what I mean by this. Early in my career, I had the chance to work with probably one of the highest performing teams I ever had. It was when I was at Boeing working for their 787 aircraft line and I was working on their digital maintenance toolbox, it's their manual. The aircraft went out into service in 2011, flagship plane, and about two years later, the aircraft was grounded. All planes on the ground because all of a sudden, the lithium ion batteries that were inside those planes started to catch fire. I mean, that's nothing, that's something no one wants to hear at 36,000 feet. The engineers actually at Boeing figured out a fix really fast. It was great. 
But the FAA said they wouldn't actually allow us to certify the planes to take back off again until the digital maintenance manual was updated. Now, you'd think that'd be easy, but in reality, a normal change to the technical diagrams, to the digital rendering, that took anywhere from three to six months. We didn't have that kind of time. So my team, we came together and we said, we've got to figure out a new way to do this. We've got to make these changes in a new collaborative way. We've got to work across different places within Boeing to see how we can quickly and safely do this. And what's cool is that we had a mission, we had a purpose, and we were given the autonomy to act. And less than one month later, those changes went live in the toolbox and those planes started taking off. Again, to this day, this is one of the highest performing teams I've had the honor of being on because we really understood each other. We understood the problem we were working on and we understood the outcomes we were aiming for. It was amazing. Now, let me ask you all a question. Who here believes that you've been at, on a high performing team at some point in your career? Raise your hand. Awesome. Many of us have. You remember that feeling? It was, felt great. The unfortunate reality though is, is that sometimes when we have to think about that high performing team, we kind of have to dig a little because it's not just our day to day world. It's something we're searching for. The reality is, is not many teams have reached the state of high performance. Here's a fact from Atlassian's State of Teams report. Only 17% of teams today possess the ingredients necessary to reach high performance. I mean, 17% of them are healthy. The whole goal of interpersonal alchemy is to turn those work acquaintance, those groups just getting by, those 83% those that are not there, turn them into that powerhouse team. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Now we're gonna do this because, hey, we're, we're doing this in a scientific way. Let's use a scientific tool. So I wanna use the scientific method today to actually walk you through this. If you don't remember that, you might have to recall back to like sixth grade when you learned about it, when you dissected frogs or something like that, which if that brings back some suppressed memories, I'm super sorry about that. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through how we're going to actually unleash these teams using this method. We're gonna go out and we're gonna ask some questions, like what is it that we're really searching to learn to, uh, really trying to learn about? We're gonna go out there, we're gonna do some research. We're gonna figure out like what makes some high performing teams out there tick. We're gonna then generate our hypothesis. We're gonna then come up with a couple experiments. And then from that, we can then start analyzing the data and then ultimately sharing that out. So let's get into this. Let's talk about the questions that we wanna ask. So for me, when I think about this question of how do I get a high performing team, there's a lot of questions that kind of come to mind. Maybe we wanna understand, maybe we think that a high performing team comes from the fact that we put all the A-star players on there, just like Magic and the Dream Team. We put them all together, that's gonna make a high performing team. Maybe if we just give them unlimited budget, maybe all the funds they need to buy the tools they need, bring in the right resources, maybe that's gonna make them high performing. Or maybe it's, we've gotta give a team a really high caliber challenge, something that's gonna be career making, something that will push them beyond they've, where they've ever been. Maybe that will make them a high performing team. Now, the problem I have with those three questions is the fact that I think they're too narrowing. They're kind of saying, hey, these specific things. For me, I honestly just have one question. And that question is, why do some teams perform better than others? Why is, in some cases where we see teams that have all the right ingredients, just utterly fail, and then those with the odds stacked against them, you know, make it out and then some in the end. So we wanna understand, again, what makes that differentiation? So cool, we've got our question in hand. I think it's time to do a little research. So for our research, I wanna tell you about a few examples around teams that truly hit that high performing stride, the teams that we look to as examples. Now, many of us here are probably from the software world. And so as being from the software world, we're familiar with you know, good examples of that. So I don't really wanna cover software teams. I wanna give you some examples of other teams outside of technology to show you what high performing teams could look like. So let's actually start off with our first one here. And that's gonna be the military. Now, a lot of people think that when they think about the military, they think about, you know, it's a slow, bureaucratic, heavy command and control structure. And yes, there's elements of that. But if you really look, the military is actually a shining example of what good teamwork looks like, especially when faced with life or death, death situations. In the book, Team of Teams by four-star general, 
Stanley McChrystal. He talks about how they had to change how they worked back in the early 2000s when they went into places like Afghanistan and Iraq. They said, we've never fought a war like this before, so we have to change our tactics. And what they focused on was they said, you know what, we have to empower our teams. We have to make it high performing teams by focusing on transparency with them. We had to empower them to execute with the knowledge they had on the ground. And by doing that, we could decentralize our decision making and not be as slow to react as we had in the past. They also talk about the aspect that trust and, tra trust, uh, and purpose were paramount to these groups. This idea that we have to be able to trust that the people to the left and the right of us had our back and that we were on the right mission. Another group that kind of speaks to this is the Navy SEALs within the military. And I, I'm a big fan of uh, the book uh, Extreme Ownership by Jaco Willick and Leif Babin. Uh, they talk in this book around how they really want, how, you know, a lot of the stuff that McChrystal talks about, but one thing they really emphasize is this, this idea of you have to focus on a resolute belief in the mission. Meaning you can't go in haphazardly and say, ah, you know, I guess I can get behind this. No, you have to be, you have to understand what you're trying to do and be committed to it. So I think out of the, this example, the military, I wanna extract a couple core elements that I believe are important for what makes a really high performing team. So first and foremost, it's extreme transparency. We've heard this from both, store, both you know, individuals here, this idea that we have to be able to share information and be open with it. We also need to think about a resolute belief in the team mission. We gotta make sure we're dedicated to what we're trying to do. And then finally, we have to decentralize decision-making and be okay with making those decisions with incomplete information. So we've got that first example then. We've got some core elements we've got. So let's go on. So I know we're in a basketball arena, but I wanna to talk to you about sports from a different lens. And one that actually some of us are probably familiar with. If you're, you know, if you're familiar with scrum, you're likely familiar with rugby. And so rugby is a great example of a sport that has high performing teams and specifically we have the All Blacks out of New Zealand. I think they're the famous team that we all know. They do the ceremonial haka at the beginning of each match, really get them pumped up, you know, get them you know, a resolute belief in what they're trying to do. Well, the thing is, is they're a really good team. It's not just show, they're a really good team. They're one of only two teams who've won three World Cups. And since they've been keeping track of world records or, or ranks since 2003, they've held the top spot. Now, one thing not many people realize about them is that they are also known for their 15 mantras for better teamwork. They have 15 sayings that they say, these are what we live by and how we team together. Things like go for the gap, things like train to win, and I think my favorite, no dickheads. These are some of the things that, although amusing, they actually reflect the All Blacks mantras of, hey, we have to come together as a team if we're going to win, if we're going to do these things, it can't just be one, it has to be all. And so for me, I think there's some really good elements then we could pull out of this. Things like, we've gotta be able to trust our people to rise to the challenge. This goes, back to, <clears throat> this goes back to what Magic was talking about with saying, your people need to be able to, you need to trust your people to go, not become complacent, go forward and start thinking about how you wanna keep getting better. This aspect of no one person is bigger than the team. We've gotta set our ego aside. We've gotta focus in on the team mentality. How can we help each other? And finally, we need to have the right skills. And by what I mean by this is that you can't just come out onto the court, or onto the field and say, hey, I wanna play rugby or I wanna play the sport and then just have a resolute belief you can do it. You have to have the skills first. So for them, they says, if we're gonna to train to win, we have to have the skills to be there. So for me, these are really important elements that we can extract out of this set of high-performing teams. All right, last example, and this is an example that if you've listened to our podcast, Team History, or maybe you've read our Work Life blog, you may have heard of, and it has a special spot in my heart, and this is the story of Ford and the Ford Taurus. So back in the 1970s, Ford faced financial crisis. You know, they were making really bad cars. They didn't look good. I remember the old acronym, Ford stood for found on road dead. That was the mantra out there. And the thing is that they were getting killed by their comp competition. Toyota was winning the, with slicker, more aerodynamic designs. They also had better integrated teams. They figured out they can't have departments. They had to have these teams that came together. 
And so for Ford, they said, you know what? We've got to do this Hail Mary pass. We can't do what we've done in the past. We have to change how we design this new Taurus. We have to change how we design it. We have to change how we build it. We have to change how we team around it. And so what they did is they did, looked at a couple things. They said, you know what? We've got to change the way we bring our teams together. No longer are we going to have manufacturing and design all these groups doing their individual thing. We need to have a holistic value stream. We need to come together as a cross-functional team. They said, you know what? We've got to empower the people on the ground through what they're called directed autonomy. This is that idea of decentralized decision-making. That aspect that says, you know what? You're closer to the work. I trust you to make that call. And finally, well, I think one of the coolest things that happened is they actually started generating this environment of psychological safety in the organization. They knew this was their chance. They said, we have to change how we treat each other. And they said, if you have any issues, let us know. And so in 1985, at the beginning, the car was set to be released. And the team says, we're not ready. And the leadership says, cool, take the time you need. And the good thing they did, because later on that year, they finally released the Ford Taurus, and it was a hit. Almost immediately, Motor Trend named it its car of 1986. And what was really cool is it informed how their other competitors in the States, things people like, or companies like GM and Chrysler, it informed how they started designing vehicles and teaming together. So let's pull out some of those, those elements here that we want to pull on. So the first one I want to kind of emphasize here is this idea that cross-functional teams versus silo departments. This was a huge learning for Ford out of this. We also have things like creating direction and autonomy. They needed to be able to say, we need to accomplish this goal, but you are closer to the work. You need to go do it to figure it out. And finally, we got to build in psychological safety at the start. So these are some great stories around how good, how teams went to kind of go against the challenge and really reach some level of high performance. And so from this, I think we could actually extract out some other core elements. And so what I've done is I've kind of thought about these. I said, you know what? If you distill those core elements down, I think we're going to get what I like to call our team alchemical elements. These are the four things that I believe that actually make high-performing teams from our stories. Things like, I believe purpose creates autonomy. I think the decentralized decision-making actually fuels empowerment within teams. We've got high trust and psychological safety. They accelerate team cohesion. And finally, we have this idea that embracing uncertainty, it actually sustains our growth as a team. So these are great. These are the things that I think are gonna be the core elements we deal with. So we've done our research, we've got our question. It's only appropriate that we start thinking about, all right, what are we, what's our theory? What's our hypothesis out there? Now, I could go in and, and tell you all about a, what a hypothesis is. You know, that idea is falsifiable, it's a statement, show you how to do it, but we got limited time. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna use the magic of cooking shows and pull out the freshly baked souffle from the oven. I'm gonna show you the hypothesis I have. So the hypothesis I'm thinking of here for this that I really wanna, I, I believe in, is this idea that we believe that embedding practices into a team that clarify purpose, decentralizes decision-making, build psychological safety and trust, and normalize uncertainty, will result in teams' full potential being unleashed. I know it's about a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? But what's important here, notice those alchemical elements there? That's the important piece. I really believe that if we harness those four elements, we can really unleash our teams. All right, so this means now we get to the fun part, right? Now we can actually do some experimentation. So what I'm gonna present with you are five different types of experiments that you could run. I wanna give you some things that you can practically do leaving today to actually try some of this out. These are gonna be things that I believe will actually unlock some of those alchemical elements and actually help you unleash your teams. So let's go through those. The first one is this idea of creating a team vision. It's an exercise that uh, Google's rework Kind of came out with and it's something i've used in the past I, I would sit down with teams and we'd say well what are we here to do we talk about well what are our values what do we think our purpose is what's our mission then and we'd spend some time coming up with those and then we'd say based on that what's our strategy then to achieve those and then ultimately what are our goals and it's amazing how just sitting down maybe popping open a confluence page and writing down this information how it can breed just clarity within your team 
And it doesn't have to be hard. It's, it's as simple as simply writing those five things down. And so for us, I did this with one of the a financial team I worked with, and it just simply clarified what they were trying to do and it helped them accelerate the work they were doing. So again, this whole idea of this helps unite us together as a team. Another exercise that I'm absolutely a fan of is from the, the knowledge body of Management 3.0. Uh, one of their exercises here is called delegation poker, and it's, it's one of the most fun, but also informative exercises you can run if you're helping to decentralize decision making. Basically how it runs is we come up with a list of our decisions that we need to make as a team, probably invite all the team members, our leadership in, and then we give everyone a pack of cards or a digital set of cards if we're doing it remotely. And we say, we've got to figure out where we all play in this decision. Maybe, I'm, a, uh, maybe I, I'm just a team member and I'm like, I don't need to have any say in it, just tell me, so I might throw out an inquire card. Maybe I'm the product owner on a team and I'm like, no, I need to make that decision. It's, it is my responsibility. I'm gonna say, I'm a tell card. And it, or we might say, you know, there's a couple of people that need to make this. We agree that we're gonna, use, we're gonna make this an agree decision, making multiple of us have to agree to actually how this is gonna done. And it's just such a great exercise to make the implicit explicit out there in terms of how we make decisions. And again, what it does, it helps increase that psychological ownership within the team for the decisions that they're accountable for. All right, another one that I love, and it actually comes from Atlassian. So if you're familiar with our team playbook, we've got our health monitor. Our health monitor is a great tool to kind of take the vitals of your team. It's a way for your team to actually step back and kind of like a retrospective, kind of say, hey, how am I doing? Do we have any things that maybe we need to work on as a team? We can look at things like, do we have a good shared understanding? You know, do we have the right tools to do our job? And what's neat is here at Atlassian, we run this all the time. We actually run, ran this with part of our services organization, around 150 people, maybe about a dozen teams. And what it did is it actually informed us how we wanted to actually do some new restructuring how we offered our services, how we team together. And it's something now that we're gonna to look to run again. And so for me, I always recommend teams run a health monitor every three to six months, just like you go to the doctor, get that checkup. We wanna do that for our team as well. Another one from our team playbook that I'm a big fan of is this idea of a ritual reset. Ritual resets are a great way for teams to really focus in on where are they spending their time and where can they be spending their time that's more valuable. What you essentially do is we sit down with a team and we look at what we do together. We say, all right, what are the sessions or the meetings or the ceremonies that we love? What are the things that we love doing and we, they shouldn't go away? And we look and say, well, what are the ones that, you know what, we need to do these, but they kind of stink, like we gotta fix these. And best of all, what are the ones that we should just get out of there? What are the ones we should delete? And because maybe they should be an email, maybe they should be a Slack message, something like that. And the idea is it gives, again, ownership to that team to be able to go forward and say, all right, we care about our time. We care about how we team together. We own how we team together. So a great technique to do that. The last one I have is always a fun one. So this is the idea of improv. This idea that, hey, all you need is a room or a Zoom, in, in my opinion. And you gotta have a, you know, a starting question. And you can get te teams starting to think about some of the unpredictable things that they might come across. Remember that uncertainty breeds, <clears throat> uh, bre breeds cohesion? We've got this idea that when we come together, we can figure out how to get each other's backs. We can figure out how we wanna help each other. And again, that creativity is sparked through that. So, uh, I like to experiment. I'm a, I'm a scientist. So actually I'd like us to do one more experiment today and I think you know where this is going, I bet. So what I want you to do is I want you to find a partner. Let me look around, see if you got some. I know we got some people out here that are spread out, but find a partner, okay? Once you find a partner, look around. I want you to go ahead and pick one who's gonna be the leader here. Who's gonna be the lead? I usually do something like look down at your shoes, who's got the brighter pair of shoes on, whoever that is, you're the leader. Can I get my leaders, raise your hands? Who are my leaders out there? Awesome, I see some hands. All right, the other person, you are gonna be the follower. And so what the leader is going to do, leader, you're going to start moving your body, moving your hands around, doing some things, whatever you'd like, whatever feels good. And followers, I want you to mimic their movements to the best of your ability. No talking, we're just gonna see if we can keep in sync with each other, okay? All right, you game? I'm gonna put 60 seconds on the clock and I want you to go for it, all right? 
Your time starts now. All right, see if you can mimic. For those out there who uh, don't have a partner, join me. Can you see how where I'm going? Oh, I love it. I love the participation. <laughs> I'm not gonna make anyone do that. <laughs> All right, few more minutes, folks. Or a few more seconds. 30 more seconds. Oh, I love it, people are moving. Again, try to predict. Got some waving out there. I love it, I love it. All right, five more seconds. Three, two, one. Good job, everybody. Thank you, good job. Yeah, give yourself a round of applause, good job. Now, I love that because again, we kind of get outside of our comfort zone there. We kind of start becoming a little bit more human with each other. It's a great way to kind of unlock some of that performance. All right, so if you are going out there and you're looking to improve your teams, again, three great bodies of knowledge here. Our Atlassian team playbooks, we've got over 50, pay, I think we have over 50 plays in there that can help you figure out new ways of teaming. You got the management 3.0 body of knowledge, one of my favorites, as well as Google's rework. So we've done our experiments, or at least some form of it, right? Now we can move on to analyze the data, communicate the results. But here's the problem. We actually didn't complete our experiments. We haven't even run an experiment yet beyond maybe doing a little exercise here. So because of that, we can't analyze our data. We can't communicate results yet. And so here's my call to action to you coming out of this thing. Figure out what you want to experiment with. Pick one of those five things out there. Maybe you want to do a little improv with your team. Maybe you want to go do a ritual reset. But pick one of those activities to experiment with your team. Actually see how it works. Look at it and say, hey, did we get better? Did we run the ritual reset and all of a sudden I freed up about five hours of meetings a week? Awesome. And then most importantly, I want you to share that information out there. Share it back to the world. I would love to hear about it. Find me on LinkedIn. Find me on Twitter. Let me know. Hashtag interpersonal alchemy. I want to hear how you're making your teams more high performant. And if you need a little help, one of the things that Atlassian has invested in over the last year is this idea of working with our customers to help them improve their practices, to help improve their ways of working. And so we've actually stood up a program. It's called Dr. Wow, Ways of Working. See what we did there? That program is all focused on working with our customers to look at things like, hey, are your teams healthy? Maybe we need to have some better meetings. Maybe we need to connect strategy to execution. These are things that all companies struggle with, and we'd love to partner with you to help you do that, not just from our tooling perspective, but from your practices perspective. So with that said, that's my story today. I wanna to thank you all for being here. I truly appreciate you joining me. I regularly share these kind of tips on LinkedIn, so please do connect. I'd love to connect with you, learn about the things you're doing as well. So with that said, Enjoy the rest of work life, everyone. Thanks so much.